Let's talk about intarsia, also known as picture knitting. And in intarsia, we are able to set blocks of color inside one row or round of knitting, building up um, different motifs, different effects. Um, you can use it to create cute little tummies on penguins, for instance, or you can make Rudolph in the middle of a Christmas sweater. Intarsia Knit Flat is remarkably simple as long as you remember two things, and I really encourage you not to get intimidated by this technique at all. One of the key things to know about intarsia is that you use one yarn supply for each block of color. So we would need a blue yarn, a pink yarn, and a brown yarn, but even if this was brown, we would still need two balls of brown. So on Poppy here, who is knit flat and seamed up the back, I have a ball of black, a ball of white, and a ball of black again, because we're using these completely separately. Each one of these sections is single thickness, which is one of the ways that intarsia is different from stranded knitting. This is all one thickness of yarn, which means that it is drapey, it is flexible, and it is um, sort of a different gauge than a stranded color work would be. So we are gonna talk about this incredibly simple method. To have different yarn supplies, there are different um, options. You can buy little plastic bobbins, or you can wind yarn butterflies. If you are working on a small project, you could also have mini skeins. Mini skeins or bigger balls are a little awkward depending on how many of the yarn, um, you, like yarn colors you need. If you've got seven yarns in a row and you've got a full 100 gram ball, it gets a little more awkward. Or if these are dangling off your knitting, um, the plastic bobbins can uh, get more heavy. So I'm gonna quickly show you how to make a yarn butterfly. And a yarn butterfly is great because once you've got it done, the uh, yarn just pulls gently and untangled from it. So they're fantastic. To make a yarn butterfly, lay the end across your palm, hook it around your thumb, and then hook it, so you're gonna go over your thumb in this direction, over your pinky in that direction. This is gonna build up a figure eight of yarn. Once you have enough yarn, cut it with another six inches, uh, or so, 10, what, that would be 15 centimeters, um, and then wrap it around the center of your little butterfly here. Wrap it up, tuck it under one of the wraps, and then remember that we are gonna be pulling from the other end. So this tucked end is not the one we will be pulling from. Other, this one will just naturally pull free and um, untangled from your butterfly. So once you have a yarn supply for every color in the row, um, so in this case, one, two, three, then you're ready to start. Um, you'd be following your pattern and in intarsia knitting, it is probably going to be necessary for you to figure out chart reading. I have a chart reading video, which I will link down below for you to go over and uh, learn about that, but it's really simple. It's like following a map of your stitches. So in this example, I'm gonna put a little blue square in the middle of a pink field of yarn. I'm going to knit across to the designated stitches in the middle. Again, I would be following a chart if working a pattern, but in this example, I'm just going to work across. When it's time to join the yarn, um, the joining process is just like joining any other yarn. Just let it dangle off the back and start knitting. Knit as many stitches as indicated in your pattern. drop this yarn, grab the new yarn, and it's once we've joined these initial stitches where the two main principles of intarsia will come into play. We now have three balls of yarn actively attached to our knitting, plus three ends of yarn. So that's a little complicated back here, but just remember always knit with the ball of yarn and not knit with the end. I'm gonna turn my row, and that's gonna bring us to the first principle of intarsia knitting. Always start a row with your yarns untangled. So get them set up in the order that they would present across the needle, so right, middle, left, and only then start working. It's very tempting sometimes to start working um, 
with it just a little tangled and I'll do it after every other row. But with intarsia, it's just so much easier if you're always starting with an tidied, prepared, untangled set of um, yarn supplies and you just give yourself a gift um, for future rows. Now you'll see that this last stitch of pink wanted to go really big and floppy and that is of course because it's an unsecured end and it's just like when you join yarn in any other project. Once you're past that first floppy stitch, uh, weaving in ends afterwards will take care of that. So let's just ignore that for the moment. All right, so the first big principle of uh, intarsia is start your row with an untidy or with a untangled yarns. The second main principle is old yarn always goes over the new yarn. So the way I like to remember this is my old yarn is left behind and it's right that my new yarn comes from the right. So then I just work across again, just knitting and purling. It's nothing special. You're not holding the yarn any differently than you would for regular knitting. It's a really easy color technique. I'm at the end of my color block. So I am going to, again, drop my old yarn left over right. New yarn's coming up and that's twisting it. So like I said, for me, the way I remember it is um, old yarn is left behind. Other like people like to remember old yarn over. So hopefully one of those two little memory devices helps you. So again, I'm going to turn my yarn and I'm just going to do a little bit of untidying uh, there. Now, when we go to a regular part of our knitting, if we um, look, we've got nice joins there and the yarn doesn't come apart. If we weren't doing that over under left behind, the blocks of color work would just sort of sit like three completely separate blocks of knitting. They wouldn't actually be joined pieces. And by twisting the yarns at every junction, we are anchoring each block of color to the block beside it. We were making a single fabric. If we weren't doing that, we would end up with three completely separate strips of fabric in this example. One tip I'd like to give you about the purl side, perhaps especially if you are a continental knitter, is there is a thing that can happen when you go to throw the old yarn over and to the left, you can accidentally create a yarn over here, uh, which obviously we don't want to do. So just remember to make sure that you are doing the twist of yarn in front of your fabric and don't involve your needles. So as you can see here, by going to the left and here coming up to the right, these yarns are twisting. They're kind of crossing over. And it's that twist that secures each block of fabric to its buddy and doesn't create gaping. If you occasionally forget that, that's okay. When you're weaving in ends, you can go back and kind of just um, make that disappear, make that vanish on the, the seam there. So don't feel like you have to frog uh, unless uh, it's somewhere and it's egregiously long or something along those lines. So left, old yarn is left behind. New yarn is coming from the right. I've twisted them together. And now we're locked in and groovy. The second tip I'd like to give you is about um, little tiny bits of color inside other bits of color and using stranded color work. Let's say in this design, I wanted to put a little extra bit of pink here in the center two stitches. Um, in intarsia, the rule would be that I would have to join a new yarn for a little bit, a small blob of color here. Uh, and a lot of people wonder why can't you just strand the knitting behind it, uh, which would look like this. Left, oh, we would still do left over right. And we would do our two. And then rather than joining a new color, I would now knit with pink. So I would strand the color behind. And then I would pick up the blue, which would be st now stranded behind the pink. And I would work across here. I would do left over right, left old yarn is left behind, and I would work across. 
and obviously that is physically doable and I'm not going to tell you that that is uh, illegal because there are no knitting police, but I do want you to th consider a couple of things if this is a choice you're thinking of making. If it's a small area of color, it probably won't affect things as much, but stranded knitting famously is less stretchy than other knitting. So the strands can become too short and you can get puckering. You have um, the strands keeping it from being as stretchy as the fabric around it, and it's also double thick. So it's gonna change the drape, the um, flexibility, and even the gauge. Stranded knitting is uh, usually squarer than um, stockinette knitting. So stockinette knitting, if you look at any gauge numbers, the number of stitches in a gauge swatch will be smaller than the number of rows in a gauge swatch, and that's because stitches are wider Vs than they are tall. So we have a little bit of a rectangle. It's not a perfect square, our Vs. And when you do stranded knitting, they tend to go squarer, and so the gauge can change. And again, like I said, the flexibility and the tension and the thickness changes. Stranded knitting is different. This is a single layer of fabric. There is no strand behind this. It is as flexible, as drapey, and amazingly beautiful. Um, now, of course, having um, joined this yarn without twisting it, because we couldn't twist when we were joining, we're going to have gaps at the bottoms and then at the tops where we're cutting yarn. So these holes need to be dealt with when we're sewing in our ends. And you can see them here, right? That is not great for our fabric. Also at the top here, although less so. So let's weave in ends and deal with that. If you've paid attention to sort of the flow of knitting stitches, you'll know that they go up behind the next stitch, down and then under here, and then up here, behind here, with the yarn would travel down here and under here. So there is this beautiful flow of loops all interchanged. And when we are weaving this in, we want our end not to go in the direction where that hole would get no support, but we want it to go in the opposite direction. So not this way, which would open the, the hole, but this way, which will close that hole. So not this way, but this way. And then we can use these beautiful twists to hide our ends. So let's just double check. Yep, that hole's closed. So now I'm just going to weave my yarn through the twists. And I always like to split the plies when weaving in yarn. The twist of the plies helps grab onto. So rather than just going underneath the yarn, the yarn is plied, I'm going through the plies, and that tight, tighter twist, that, that, that spiral helps grab the ends. So you would just go up. If it is being worn, I always like to go in two directions, so then I would weave back down. Um, the reason I go in more than one direction is that one stretch can kind of pull a let end loose but if it's going in two directions, the, the circumstances in which a stretching fabric would pull that out enough that it pops to the front is just, um, well, I can't imagine how that would happen. So now I am going to weave that in. Or now I'm gonna cut that, and then I will do all four of these ends. And hopefully this tutorial has made you realize it's all just knitting and purling, which you're already good at. So go have fun. Keep your yarn untangled and always do the twist. Happy knitting.